Hello and welcome to this episode of The Cyclo Edition, the podcast for those looking to go above and beyond in their understanding of the organic literature. I'm Wesley Sorts, and I'm joined today by Grace Lutovsky and Matt Genzink. The paper we will be discussing today is titled Asymmetric Total Synthesis of Arcutinidine, Arcutinine, and Arcutine by the group of Ong Lee, who is a professor at the State Key Laboratory of Bioorganic and Natural Products Chemistry at the Shanghai Institute of Organic Chemistry. His group focuses on the total synthesis of structurally and biologically interesting natural products. The paper today describes the development of a biomimetic rearrangement to access the structural skeleton of arcutine diterpenoid alkaloids and the total synthesis of a few of these natural products. So today we're going to go over uh, the total synthesis of arcutinidine. So you might have seen that in JAX recently they published two papers synthesizing this molecule from the groups of Ong Lee and Richmond Sarpong. And looking back about a month ago, the Chin group also published um, a synthesis of this molecule. So today we're going to focus on the Ong Lee synthesis, but we're going to bring up and kind of compare and contrast all three methods and how each group synthesized the same molecule. Arcutinidine, along with a few other of its derivatives that are mentioned in these papers and synthesized in a couple of them, is a diterpenoid alkaloid. These diterpenoid alkaloids are made up of 20 carbons, or they're a C20 uh, unit. This is because they're derived from five isoprene subunits. And so there have been over a thousand of these diterpenoids that have been isolated from natural products and identified just through these isolations. The family of which that we're focusing on today is the arcutine family. And these ones are of interest as they haven't had a significant amount of synthesis effort put towards them yet, as well as they have a very complex three-dimensional multi-cyclic structure. Yeah, so like you were saying, Wes, this arcutinidine molecule has a lot of topological complexity and a lot of stereochemical information embedded into the molecule. Specifically, there are a number of quaternary stereocenters. There are two different bicyclo 222 octanes and they're doubly fused together. So there's a lot of complexity there. And then there's also a fused pyrroline moiety that has created problems for chemists in the past trying to synthesize this. So the Chin group who came out with their synthesis of arcutinidine in late May had previously tried to synthesize atropropurin, which is like a simpler core of arcutinidine. But when they synthesized that and wanted to expand their synthesis to arcutinidine, they ran into some problems, specifically with the proline ring and the tertiary alcohol that was present. So they thought at that time they had to rethink their synthesis. So one way groups approach total synthesis is by looking at how this molecule may have been made in nature. So how a molecule is derived from another complex molecule. And so in this paper, they talk about using the general approach of forming the hetidine skeleton and then using that to do a one, two alkyl shift, which will eventually become their product. Right, and so th- this hetidine skeleton in and of itself is already a diterpenoid alkaloid, but it's been synthesized uh, more frequently through total synthesis. In uh, 2015, Sarpong actually did some density functional theory calculations that showed this hetidine skeleton could undergo um, a 1-2 alkyl shift and give you the arcutine skeleton. This 1-2 alkyl shift would come from a wagner mirwine rearrangement, and so In this paper, uh, Ong Lee is proposing to basically find a way to generate the carbocation that you need to undergo this rearrangement. Yeah, so the general strategy here is going to be to first construct the two doubly fused bicyclo-222 octane rings, and then after those are established to kind of build up the functionality, including the pyrroline motif. So just to preface the synthesis, we are going to go through this in as much detail as it took us to read this, being new readers of the organic chemistry literature. So at some points when we felt we needed to go through the mechanism to fully understand what was going on, we will do that. And also in the paper, they make some rearrangements of how they draw the molecule. And so especially in the YouTube versions, we will show how they rearrange that. So hopefully we can all be on the same page when talking about this total synthesis. Um, So jumping right in, they start with a 1-bromo-3-hydroxyl cyclohexene S enantiomer and start off with a protection step to protect that alcohol. So from there, they do a lithium halogen exchange with tert-butyl lithium, so exchanging the lithium for the bromine, which then 
can react with DMF to form an aldehyde um, where the bromine originally was. One kind of just like interesting point here that Matt had pointed out when we were first going through these is that they were doing all of these first few steps on the decagram synthesis. And so they were using you know, tert butyl lithium, which is the most reactive of the butyl lithiums on a decagram scale. Got to have some sure hands there. <laughs> yeah, so at this point, they've set up their reactants for the first diels alder reaction, which is really where they're going to start building up this complexity and forming tricyclic intermediate. So this is catalyzed by BF3 etherate, which is uh, Lewis acid, essentially just lowering the LUMO of the dienophile and catalyzing the reaction. They then add in vinyl lithium, and so that attacks the aldehyde, forming your alcohol and a terminal alkene. And they then protected the alcohol that is formed with a mom chloride, making a methoxymethyl ether group that is enantiopure. So from there, they introduce perchloric acid, which will cleave the ketal protecting group. And then it also does a migration of the carbon, carbon double bond um, to form an alpha beta unsaturated ketone. One interesting part of this is that they get selective deprotection of the ketal protecting group, but the xylol protecting group is not cleaved. So initially when they protected that first alcohol, they used a tert-butyl diphenyl xylol protecting group, which is a little bit less common than I think the most common, which is just a TBS group. Um, and this tert-butyl diphenyl xylol protecting group has a little bit more steric bulk and is a little bit more stable to acid than the TBS protecting group. So the next step of this reaction is using lithium HMDS, which is a base, to deprotonate an alpha proton, which forms a anionic intermediate, which then can undergo the Diels-Alder reaction. That is one of their key steps in this synthesis. I think this is kind of an interesting strategy to make a diene, basically starting from an alpha-beta unsaturated ketone, and then just deprotonating, Grace, like you said, the alpha hydrogen and kind of generating that diene in situ, which can then react with a dienophile intramolecularly. Yeah, well, and or they suggest that this would go through what's called the anionic uh, diels alder mechanism. Basically what happens there is when they form this uh, unsaturated enol, the alkoxy group actually helps direct some of the regioselectivity that this reaction will have. Um, but because the oxygen is in the three position rather than say the one or the four position there, it dictates where the more negative um, charge is going to be in that diene. One of the other interesting things in this step is that all three of the recent papers on the synthesis of arcutinidine use a Diels alder to form this 222 bicyclooctane structure in the arcutinidine skeleton. And in this case, they go about forming it, I think, the most unique way, which is through this anionic deals all their pathway, whereas in the Sarpong paper and the Chin paper, they start with a aromatic system and then they de-aromatize that system and then do a 4 plus 2 cyclization there. So following that step, um, there's a dehydration to form an alkene. And at this point, they've basically established something that looks very similar to the hedidine scaffold, and they're ready for their rearrangement to generate the arcutene skeleton. This is probably the step of this paper that is kind of the most novel and interesting um, and makes this paper really impactful is the way that they went about generating the cationic intermediates that you need to do this rearrangement. And so they intentionally installed that uh, mom protecting group on the alcohol that you form when you condense with the aldehyde. And they did that intentionally so that once you get to the skeleton, if you add a Lewis acid, and they had to screen a good number of Lewis acids to find the proper one that would do this, you selectively deprotect the mom, leaving you an oxonium cation that you then undergo a Prins cyclization from the alkene that they had uh, formed in the previous step, and then undergo the wagner meerwein rearrangement to give you the Arcutene skeleton. So the wagner meerwein rearrangement is the one-two alkyl shift that we mentioned earlier. And kind of what you were saying, Wes, this reaction took a lot of optimization, right? You said they had to screen a lot of Lewis acids. If you think about the mom protecting group, there are two different Lewis basic oxygens on there, and the Lewis acid could potentially coordinate to either Lewis basic site. Coordinating to one would give you the deprotected alcohol, which is undesired in this case, in which they mentioned that some of these Lewis acids did give, 
whereas coordinating to the other Lewis basic site would give the desired oxonium species. So going forward with the synthesis, the next step is a Mukiyama hydration, uh, which is just the hydration of the alkene that adds an alcohol um, with Markovnikov selectivity to the tertiary position. This alcohol had previously given other groups uh, difficulty to install later on in their syntheses, so it was uh, neat to see how they were able to install this in the synthesis. Yeah, and the author stated here that uh, this step also took a fair amount of optimization. Normally, Mukayama hydrations are done with cobalt. That's kind of the standard conditions, but here they moved away from cobalt eventually and found that manganese worked better. So they follow this up by doing a selective CH oxidation using the Sharpless protocol. They do this to install a carbon neal on the furan ring, giving them the lactone. They do this so that they can eventually cleave this lactone, leaving them with an aldehyde that they can then use to install the paroline ring that they'll need to eventually finalize the arcutinidine synthesis. Uh, so their next step is to do a Wittig reaction um, to just install a CH2 group to the ketone, which is located on the peripheral bicyclo 222 octane ring. Um, and just a reminder with Wittig reactions, because we have an ester and a ketone in this molecule, they're always going to add to an aldehyde, then a ketone, and then maybe an ester. So they were able to get selectivity for this carbonyl over the ester carbonyl. And then also in this step, they just do a protection of the tertiary alcohol. So then the next step is forming an enolate from the ester with LDA and then methylating it. They tried to methylate it originally with methyl iodide and found out that that didn't work well and ended up working with methyl triflate, which worked better. The next step is an allylic oxidation. They get really good regio selectivity here, oxidizing the CH2 next to the alkene versus the CH next to the alkene. The allylic oxidations are typically known to have really good positional selectivity, and that's kind of showcased here. They actually get the wrong diastereomer, though, so the authors kind of say that they get the wrong diastereomer, but they're going to keep going and kind of address that problem later. In the next step, they do a lithium alumina hydride reduction of the lactone to open the lactone, leaving them with two alcohols, and then they globally oxidize the molecule, giving them now an aldehyde, a ketone on the single ring, and then oxidizing up that alcohol that they installed in the wrong diastereomer on the 222 bicycle. Um, and they did this using chromium oxide. Over the next steps, the authors are going to selectively react with each of these carbonyls. So they start by doing a condensation with hydroxylamine to the aldehyde. The formation of this oxime installs the requisite nitrogen to be able to form the proline cycle that they're going to have to have for the final reaction. So after the condensation, they use sodium borohydride to both reduce the enone to the alcohol, and here they get the desired diastereomer. So then the oxime is reductively cleaved with titanium trichloride and sodium cyanoborohydride to the corresponding amine, which then cyclizes spontaneously to the imine, uh, and this yields arcutinidine, the natural product. Um, this was a nice fluid synthesis for us at least to kind of follow along and see kind of exactly where everything hit. They do go on and do an acylation of the allylic alcohol to um, do the total synthesis of arcutinine. And then they also do an acylation with an enantio pure compound to give you the arcutine compound as well. And so in total, they did three enantiomeric syntheses of three of these arcutine-based compounds. So I think this strategy that Lee used in this total synthesis um, was really interesting, especially when comparing it to the other two papers by Ch uh, Chin and Sarpong during the, that came out during the same time frame, because they built the tetracyclic core first and then added in the proline ring. Um, but the other two papers took a different approach and installed the proline ring in one of their first few steps and then built the core later on. Right, and so looking at um, the Sarpong engine papers, so instead of going after this bio-mimicking rearrangement, they instead identified a, d a different initial disconnection that they wanted to go after retro than synthetically. Um, they looked instead at this um, you know, complex 3D core and said there is a, you know, and said, look, there's a 
bond in an eight-membered ring that's multiple bridging that we could do a coupling between either two ketones or through um, uh, an alkene and a ketone using samarium iodide to do um, a CC coupling reaction. They broke this bond and then they went about trying to develop a method to get towards that final intermediate to then do this final coupling reaction. One of the, the real neat things though that I liked about Sarpong's paper was the fact that he really went after kind of trying to make the biggest disconnections you possibly could and then do small functional group interchanges to get to the rest of the way basically. Really want his his real goal was to build the the core, the arcutene core, and then hopefully from that you could have a skeleton built to then, you know, constantly be able to change and just make derivatives of rather than only making the one molecule that you're looking for. Yeah, so like you said, Wes, the, the Sarpon paper is really just building up the arcutene core and then kind of establishing the functionality in the second half of the synthesis. Um, and this is somewhat similar to the Angli paper, like we talked about before. Um, the Angli paper really first builds up that the, the two bicyclooctane rings. And then in the second half of the synthesis, they're really just trying to do two things. One is kind of establish the functionality that's needed, and then two is synthesizing that pyrroline moiety, which takes a number of steps. Um, so in both cases, they're, they're kind of trying to build up the skeleton first and then establish some functionality, but they go about it in two distinct ways. Yeah, and even like thinking about the, the chin paper, which it, it was interesting reading through these because you could find some places where they did some similar transformations, not at the same time in the synthesis, but you'd recognize reagents or recognize a step that installed a certain functionality. And so it was really interesting to kind of look through these three papers and think about why they went in a certain direction versus, you know, the one that a different author chose. And I think even kind of going off of that, I don't know about Ang Lee, but I think, I know at least Sarpong and Chin have both made molecules that are similar to this. So there is a lot of precedent for kind of some of the disconnections that you could think about making to access these molecules. And it's interesting to see how all of these authors kind of use those um, pieces of precedent and came up with new ideas to access these molecules. And I think as a learning opportunity uh, for students, it's really cool that these papers all came out around the same time period, uh, because oftentimes in courses, you'll be comparing a total synthesis from the 80s to one now. Um, and there's just been a lot of chemistry developed between those years to make it like the synthesis more concise. Um, so being able to compare three different strategies that they all have the same chemical toolbox to use, but all went about making this molecule differently is just a really interesting insight. When it shows, it, it gives you an idea of what each author kind of cares about um, when you start looking at this and, and where they focus. Right, so the Ong Lee paper, you know, was interested in mimicking the biological or the proposed biological synthesis through this rearrangement. You know, Richmond Sarpong was really interested in, you know, the most bridge dis uh, disconnection that you possibly could in the molecule and seeing where that got you, and really interesting in, in kind of applying that antibio pathway. And then the Chin paper, you know, was um, very interested in like using kind of some of their background knowledge and synthesizing these molecules to just redesign the system to allow them to access a new molecule. And so, you know, each author approached it with a different background and a different focus on what they wanted to learn from the papers. And I think that's why you see them all in the same journal, right? They all add something different to the discussion, not only of their own papers, but of total synthesis of these dietropenoid compounds. And that's our show. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Cyclo Edition. For more information on the paper discussed, we have included a selection of the resources we used in our research at the end of the YouTube video. This was our take on a very interesting paper, and we would love to continue the conversation with you. Please comment below the YouTube video and reach out on social media. You can follow the Cyclo Edition on Twitter and Instagram, where we will post updates about our next episode. You can find the Cyclo Edition wherever you listen to podcasts and on YouTube. If you enjoyed this episode, please like and subscribe. We release episodes every other week, and our next episode will be released August 5th. We will provide the paper we will be discussing during the next episode in the description of this podcast, as well as on social media a few days before the next episode is released. We hope you'll tune in on August 5th for our next episode.